I really like to think of mental health struggles as brain health struggles, because oftentimes what's behind our anxiety or depression, you know, is really something going on on a biological level with your brain. Welcome to the Express Soul Health and Wellness Podcast. In each episode, you'll learn from experts about the best practices and technologies to live a happier, healthier, and hopefully a longer life. Here is your host, Claudia Erdinola. Welcome to Express All Health and Wellness Podcast. My name is Claudia Urdinola. I am a professional engineer with a passion for health and wellness. If this is your first time here with us at our podcast, I invite you to subscribe right here and hit the notification button so you'll be notified every time we bring new content related with health and wellness. Also, check all our social media outlets. And for those of you who don't know, we bring this content totally free of charge to you, and we kindly um, ask you to support our sponsors down in the description box below. Our sponsor today is Espresso Coffee. And this Espresso Coffee is my brand of coffee, which has been designed with your health in mind. All my coffees are low in acidity. They are clean of molds. Sana is organic, certified organic, and they are all low acidity, good for your health. So go to www.expressolcoffee.com and order your coffees today with the special discount, Podcast 15. Again, Podcast 15, all in caps, at the checkout box and you will have 15% off your order. Our subject today is brain mapping. What is brain mapping? How this technology of the neuromodulation and neurofeedback can help in optimize the brain. These technologies and the implications into the mental health and the brain optimization are going to be discussed with us today by Toby Passman. Toby is the CEO and founder of Neuroflex and the host of the Neuroflex podcast. He is a neurophysiology trainer with a master's in psychology from Lean University, and it is a board certified QEEG brain mapping and EEG neurofeedback. Here is Toby to talk to us about brain mapping and brain optimization. So Toby, welcome to Express All Health and Wellness Podcast. I am thrilled to have you today at my podcast because the subject of your expertise is in the news. We are learning a lot about this brain optimization technologies and I'm excited that you're here to tell us all about it. How are you today? Definitely, Claudia. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm doing great. Amazing. So let's start by uh, telling our audience what exactly is brain mapping? That's what you do. Yes. Yeah. So brain mapping for people at home is basically a type of brain scan that evaluates your brain on an electrical level. So just to, to preface this, our brains communicate both on a chemical as well as electrical level. So we're probably all familiar with the different neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. Mm -hmm. Those are the different chemicals the brain uses to communicate with itself. But the brain also runs on electricity. So those electrical rhythms are known as brainwave patterns. And that's what we're able to actually measure with brain mapping. So because of it can be a bit difficult to measure the chemicals in someone's brain, it actually, in order to accurately do that, uh, you'd have to do a spinal tap, which is not going to be yeah. an easy test to, to pitch people on. So instead, no. a lot of the research has been conducted measuring the electrical activity because you can measure that completely non-invasively with a test called an EEG. So this is uh, basically a swim cap looking device. Those are the caps. Um, they basically sit on the head um, in which the brainwave activity within someone's brain, it emanates up to the scalp. And then this cap is able to actually record um, what those electrical activity um, that has emanated up to the scalp. And we're able to actually quantify that into images so we can better 
kind of visualize areas of someone's brain that's really underactive or overactive, or if it's working really optimally. So it's basically a way to assess someone's brain activity because, you know, in psychiatry or other mental health fields, you know, we don't really like Dr. Daniel Amen, a famous psychiatrist, and neuroscientist talks about how, you know, psychiatry is the only, excuse me, the only medical profession that doesn't actually examine the organ in which they're treating. You know, if you have a heart issue and you go to the cardiologist, you're not going to just tell them your symptoms and they're going to prescribe, you know, I mean, hopefully not, you know, they're probably going to slap on some electrodes and run some tests, you know, evaluate how your heart uh -huh. is functioning. So really, I think it's quite barbaric the way that psychiatry and mental health continues to operate today is basically the same as it has, you know, a century ago where you go in, you tell uh, a clinician the symptoms you're experiencing. They usually give you a diagnosis, which then comes with a medication, you know, and people I think are, are starting to see the problems with that whole situation. You know, a lot of commonly prescribed psychiatric medications like Adderall, SSRI, antidepressants, anxiety medications, a lot of these things have, you know, serious side effects and also really yeah. serious long-term ramifications. So people are definitely looking for, for alternative options. And that's kind of, kind of where, you know, something like neurofeedback comes in, but we'll talk about that I'm sure later, but basically the yes. brain mapping is basically just that initial baseline assessment to evaluate, to see how someone's brain is performing on a biological level. Okay. And, and this test has to be performing someone awaken. It has to be sleeping. What are the conditions? And if anybody can, you know, have this kind of, a, um, a brain mapping or it has to be a, a certain ages are appropriate. What, what are the conditions to get this kind of brain mapping? Yeah. So basically anyone can get a brain map, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's clinicians that work with infants or, or babies, toddlers, and then, you know, I've seen clients all the way up into their nineties. So it's not really age restricted whatsoever. As far as, you know, whether someone's awake or asleep, that really depends on the purpose of the study. So for instance, neurologists use EEGs to measure okay. seizure activity and also sleep disorders. So it's common for people to go, you know, and do a sleep study where they're going to have, you know, a bunch mm -hmm. of electrodes covering their whole head. It looks a bit different than the caps that we use, but basically the same premise, you know, evaluating how the brain's electrical activity is, but for a much different purpose. That's looking for gross abnormalities that, you know, maybe indicating seizures or sleep disorders. So brain mapping within the mental health or peak performance field is usually conducted when someone is awake, ideally when they're not drowsy, they're in an alert state. Um, and ideally we want to get it as close to, you know, normal brain functioning as possible. Meaning, you know, we don't want someone to chug a bunch of caffeine before coming in. You know, ideally, if someone's able to not take uh, medication that they're taking just the day that they do the brain map, that's also ideal just to see how the brain is kind of operating on an organic level. But yeah, anyone, you know, brain mapping is used, you know, by a lot of different types of professionals for different purposes. And really, my goal with Neuroflex is bringing these technologies from their traditional use, which is research labs and clinics and really bringing it to the mainstream biohacking and peak performance community. You mentioned the word, and I think and, and it is it's a personal opinion that the biohacking is the science of the future. This is where we are taking experimentation, uh, you know, everything that has to do with bringing a human to the next level. And now it, it is a perfect time to do it because we also learning that the traditional medicine is just, um, in many cases, is not one fix, fit all. It's not true. So you just mentioned it. And traditionally, someone that had uh, visited, you know, uh, uh, you know, a neurologist uh, or a psychiatrist, it goes, tells the symptoms, and based on what you say, here is your prescription. That pill fits all. And we know today that may not be the appropriate treatment, that may be 
um, not even uh, appropriate for your condition, not even for your personal situation. So these technologies, I think, are coming in, in a moment when people are really eager to understand better their physiology and how far they can take their development. And now with all of this uh, that you're describing, the brain mapping, I think something very key that you just mentioned here is that this is an individualized treatment. Means it is catered, is, is designed for each individual needs. And, and I think is what everything, I mean, the, here is the magic. What is good for me may not be good for my husband or for my sister. We got different uh, you know, brain waves and situations going on. And we may want to enhance some area of the brain more than other, you know. And, and there, here come my, my next question, because this is interesting. So this uh, uh, biofeedback, this, this brain mapping that you're doing using this neuromodulation, right? Um, so this technology, once you make the brain mapping, okay, you, you put the, the cap on the people, and we're going to be showing some images while we talk so our audience can see exactly what we're describing. Um, you, you translate those brain waves into images. Then what? Right. So that's, that's kind of always the initial you know, mm -hmm. baseline to start with. But then once we actually have the images, I go over that with the client. So we review basically... It, it's a little bit different if I work with people in person versus virtual. In person, we do a full 19 channel brain map. So basically looking at 19 different areas of the brain. So I go over all the results, talk about whether, you know, someone's brain is either underactive or overactive in a specific area, looking at how both the left and right hemisphere are communicating as well as different networks in the brain, how they are firing. I go over all of that data with someone um, and then we put together a personalized brain optimization program for them. So that consists of, you know, for one, doing the neurofeedback training. So neurofeedback is a, a training modality that unlike, well, I guess like the brain map, it evaluates and measures your brain waves. Mm -hmm. But unlike the brain map, it actually also teaches the brain how to create healthier brainwave patterns. So for instance, and this, this goes specifically Speaking, uh, speaking to what you were saying as far as the individualized approach is because based on each person's brain map, I put them on a very uh, different individualized neurofeedback protocol. So for what, you know, one person who's struggling with their focus and concentration, for instance, they might be put on a protocol to enhance beta brainwaves. Beta is a really fast, you know, brainwave associated with peak focus and, and concentration. But someone who struggles with anxiety or worry or insomnia, they oftentimes have too much of a particular type of beta frequency. So, you know, you could actually potentially make someone's symptoms worse if you use the same protocol for two people without actually looking at the individual differences in terms of their neurophysiology. So that's why it's always super essential to start with the brain map so you're not just shooting in the dark. Mm -hmm. So we know exactly the areas of someone's brain that we want to train, which frequencies we want to help someone increase, and which frequencies we want someone to help decrease. So with that being said, the actual neurofeedback, because I'm sure now people are, you know, have heard us say neurofeedback a few times, and they're probably thinking, what, what is that? What is so, neurofeedback? What is neurofeedback? Yes. So it's basically where electrodes are hooked up to the head, and people are basically watching they're either playing a video game. Let's use the example. They're basically playing a video game. So they're watching on a phone or tablet. They're basically seeing uh, some character. For instance, say there's a game where you fly a spaceship. So when your brain is producing the healthy brainwave pattern that we're looking for, for instance, you know, if we use the, the example of someone wanting to improve their focus and we're going to help reward them, we're going to teach their brain to produce more beta waves by rewarding them whenever they produce that pattern. So for instance, when their brain is producing those beta brain waves, they would see the spaceship fly higher and the audio will get louder. So it's direct, you know, directly telling the brain, good job, keep, mm -hmm. keep doing what it is that you're doing. 
And then when the brain, you know, when someone starts daydreaming, mind wandering, they get out of that focus state, then the spaceship flies lower and the audio gets quiet. So that's telling the brain, hey, go back to what it is that you were doing to get the screen, you know, to get the spaceship flying higher and the louder audio. So there's basically a way to provide the brain real time feedback. And I'm talking like within a hundred milliseconds. So that's actually quicker than our conscious mind can even process information. So it's very much a subconscious process of rewiring the brain um, through the use of basically holding a mirror up to the brain and telling it when it's doing well versus when it needs to adjust. Training the, the brain is all about reading, focusing, trying to get the concentration on our task that we're doing at home. Um, but seems like with these technologies, training our brains are, I mean, can be a lot more efficient if we use this kind of technology. Exactly. You know, I think, you know, people don't have to use technology to train their brain. You know, there's tools like meditation, yeah. you know, is something that's been practiced. You Breathe know, work. I mean, a lot ancient. of stuff. That's yeah. worked. Exactly. And I'm a fan of all those tech, you know, all of those modalities. But the one thing that, that they do not offer is the feedback component. Mm. So say if you're, you know, you talk about utilizing the gym, like going to the gym for your brain. So if we take, you know, if someone goes to the gym and they get, they're working with a personal trainer who tells them exactly when their form is looking really good, you know, is kind of guiding them through, okay, you know, first yes. you're going to do this then you're going to do this. Now we have a little break, you know, someone who's giving them feedback on how they're doing, their progress is going to be greatly accelerated. Mm -hmm. So that same, you know, concept, applies to someone training their brain. You can train your brain through meditating, through breath work, and I recommend people do so. But adding in something like neurofeedback can tell you specifically when you're actually in that meditative state versus when you're maybe just sitting there with your eyes closed and thinking about what it is that you're going to have for lunch that day. You know, it's going to give your brain, you're going to tell you exactly when you're doing it right versus when you're not. So this uh, neurofeedback is like a, a biostimulation of the brain, intentionally a stimulation of the brain through this technology. My question is, uh, how long it takes on, on this training, the brain, to really see like visible results, something that you said, wow, I'm, I'm measuring now my progress. I'm so focused. I can't believe um, or for someone that is suffering of depression, and we're gonna talk about it in a little bit about that, how feel how good they're feeling, or they're they're really feeling the 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 positive effects of the training. So how long is gonna take of someone? I'm, and I'm talking normally because everybody's different, but in in a regular basis, um, how long it will take if they follow a protocol of. Uh, neurofeedback like what i always emphasize here is that neurofeedback is not like taking a drug where mm -hmm. you might take a you know pop an adderall pill and you you know within 20 minutes you're feeling super alert you're super motivated you've got tons of energy so neurofeedback is not that neurofeedback is more akin to like getting in good shape getting in good physical shape right where if you're is not it progress it's a process exactly you yeah. get slowly get the progress so you know Basically, if someone's not regularly going to the gym and then they go, it doesn't matter how hard they work out that one time, they're not going to wake up the next day with a perfect physique, you know, with all the muscles and, mm -hmm. and no fat on their body. You know, it's a process that takes time to get it, your body into shape and same deal with the neurofeedback training. So basically within a few sessions, people do start seeing, you know, you know, uh, slight changes usually within three to five sessions. It's common for people to tell me that they're noticing they're sleeping better, they're waking up, you know, feeling more rested in the morning, their anxiety is reduced. Sometimes they feel, you know, mentally clearer. So usually within three to five sessions, people do start noticing something's changing. But the reason that the clients that I work with, we do a two month or sometimes a three month long program. And the reasoning behind that is that in order to get really long-term positive results from doing neurofeedback training, you want to get in at least 20 to sometimes maybe even 30 or 40 sessions. That's what the research tends to say. 
as far as the long lasting improvements that people get from doing neurofeedback training. So from the first few sessions, it's like the brain's kind of creating these new neural pathways, these new connections, it's learning this new healthier way of firing. But our brain goes back to homeostasis, to what it's always known. Mm -hmm. It will try to revert back to those old unhealthy patterns. Even though they're dysfunctional, the brain associates that with safety since that's, since it's accustomed to doing that. So that's really why you know a lot of people struggle to make behavior changes. Consciously, they're telling themselves, you know, saying I need to do year, it. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that they need, you know, I need to lose these 20 pounds that I need to go to the gym every day. But there's something subconsciously that's kind of blocking them from doing that. And we know neuroscientists estimate that about 5% of our brain activity is conscious. And then the 95% is all below the surface. That's all the subconscious and unconscious material. So in reality, when it comes to, you know, training the brain, it's really about getting to those deeper subconscious layers and helping the brain really change on a core level. But that is a process that takes some time. So really the people who see the most success from doing neurofeedback are people who understand the importance of a routine, discipline, consistency, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way that those are the people who are going to get in and stay in great shape are the people who are willing to that put the work in. Correct. I, I really, I really believe that, you know, most things in life that are worth having, you know, take some work, right? So, you know, just thinking that you're going to just, you know, slap on the electrodes a few times and you're instantly going to be cured is, is definitely not, not accurate. And that's why it's also so important too that neurofeedback is is just one tool in your brain health toolkit. So in addition to neurofeedback training, I help people you know optimize their nutrition. There so you go. Eating specific brain healthy foods to lower neural inflammation, um, to promote you know really good healthy fats that promote uh, ketosis, where the brain can actually learn to run off of fat for energy instead of glucose so fat is actually a more fuel efficient energy mm -hmm. source for the brain than running on glucose or sugar so i'm a big fan of eating you know high uh, a diet high in really healthy fats like coconut oil avocados butter yeah all of that good stuff so and then also laying the foundations for good brain health it's really important that people are sleeping well you know that they're making sure not to, you know, that they're not looking at screens late at night, that they're off of their phone, that they're sleeping in a really quiet, cool environment. So there's there's a lot of basic things that go into brain health. I know we, we kind of dove right into the deep end with the neurotechnology, but I always emphasize with the clients I work with that, you know, that you need to be doing all of these basic things or else the neurofeedback training is not going to work. You know, exactly. if you're- if you're going this... to the gym and you're you're sleeping two hours a night, and you're eating Cheetos all day, you're not going to see the results you want to. Correct. I mean, you mentioned the pillars of great health, and we talk about this in my podcast very often because having an approach, a holistic approach to optimal health is always involving more than one protocol. It is always different ways that you have to be like, is like a multifaceted protocol for you to be able to achieve that optimal health. So you mentioned it, nutrition, because yeah, the neurofeedback is working at the, you know, basically the electric uh, connections in our brain, communication that into your images, but on our, you know, at biological level, all of our biochemistry has to be in balance. And that comes from our nutrition. We need to have the right amount of nutrients. We need to feed our brain there with the right amount of foods in, in order to, to allow the, these technologies to work. We cannot let the, you know, all the work to the technologies is, is not going to work. And we have um, other doctors here on my podcast, and they say, Claudia, they, talking about depression, for example, mental health, I said, all that is involved in the biochemistry of the body 
is as important as the traumas that were um, acquired from external factors in the human, in the person. So it is a symbiosis. You need to be eating the right things and, and then having a treatment for mental health will work. But if we are treating the external factors, trying to uh, bring you from a, you know from your traumas to uh, overcome those fears and traumas, but you're eating wrong, we're never going to achieve that. No matter how many medications you take, you will never be able to get in optimal um, mental health. So I see these technologies that you're working as a, as a one of our great tools in our toolbox. And, and, and my following question is, how available is these technologies? Is something that we can um, access easily? We have to be looking for a technician like yourself, a professional in this area of the neurofeedback, um, or, or how we can, you know, are, are these technologies getting more accessible now? What, what is the status of that? Right, right. So, you know, most people that I talk to have never heard about brain mapping or neurofeedback. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm guessing the yes. same goes for, for you. For sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I so, follow you, know, you for a very long time. So I've been, I've been right. really following kind of like since the beginning, you start, uh, you know, brain mapping a lot of people and what they were reporting from the sessions, what you were able to see in the lectures, it, it was very interesting because it was not only like current status of the brainwaves, also patterns on the personality and behavior, which was very interesting. Um, right. So I knew a little bit, my audience probably never heard about that. It's something that is exactly. not that, uh, I would say it, it is not well known yet. Yes. It's kind of new. Completely. Yeah. And that's, that's the point that I'm making is that, you know, it, it's funny that people often, when, when people realize that they're like, oh, this must be some new experimental treatment option, you know, and it's like neurofeedback's actually nothing new. It's been around really since the 1960s, 1970s is when it really started get, to get going. But most people haven't heard about it because it's traditionally been buried away in different research labs, mm -hmm. small mental health clinics. So, you know, depending on where people live, there's usually one to two or maybe in a, a major metropolitan area, there might be a few neurofeedback practitioners in someone's local area. So it's something you you likely can find if you really seek it out, but it's not something that a lot of people are aware of. Now, in terms of, you know, can people do this on their own? Do people need a practitioner? You know, I would say there, there are specific devices that are you know, just made for consumers mm -hmm. um, that I recommend to some people, you know, as, as sort of an option, maybe after they work with me or instead, you know, if, if they're really just wanting to do I something for maintenance. Um, as so maintenance, mm -hmm. sure. But when it comes to, you know, actually doing, doing brain mapping and neurofeedback, there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, someone like myself, I've went through years of uh, research, you know, my college research lab, learning how to analyze and measure someone's brainwave activity. So knowing exactly, you know, what are eye blinks or muscle movements, how to edit that data out. So that's something that I, you know, I've learned all of that and I'm able to edit through also all of someone's data and then actually know based on what I'm seeing, where to position the electrodes, which protocols to run. So that's something that, you know, has really taken several years of practice and mentorship, learning from some of the top experts in my field. So regardless of whether, you know, if someone's wanting to do neurofeedback, regardless of whether they ever worked with me or not, I always recommend that people find someone who's board certified both in uh, neurofeedback, which okay. the board certification to look for there is called a BCN, a board certification in neurofeedback. And then there's another one, fewer people have it, but I really recommend which is a QEEGD or diplomat. And that's QEEG is the technical term, term for brain mapping. So looking for those couple certifications or qualifications okay. amongst practitioners that you work with is so, so important because you know, you're not gonna take your car to a mechanic that doesn't know what they're doing, who's gonna 
you know, ruin your car. You know, we see the value of taking it to someone who has experience, knowledge, expertise, you know, about cars. So when it comes to something as important as your brain, you want to make sure that the neurofeedback practitioner you work with is ideally board certified, who's been doing this and, you know, has a lot of experience working with clients because kind of, as I alluded to earlier, you know, neurofeedback is not, you're not, you're not going to, you know, hurt someone long-term by doing the wrong neurofeedback protocol, but you can worsen someone's symptoms. Mm. If you don't know what you're doing and you train the brain in the wrong way or push the brain too hard or too fast in a direction it doesn't like, someone can experience side effects. So it's really important, I think, to work with someone who has a thorough understanding of how the brain actually functions and how to train it. So that's kind of what I would say, you know, there's, there's options for at home stuff, but then there's also, if people want to really have a more comprehensive, you know, uh, approach where they work with someone, then there's that option as well. We're talking here about the brain as a muscle that we are intentionally uh, stimulating and exercising for a desired outcome. My question to you is, if someone comes with a brain injury to your practice, is the, uh, the neurofeedback an appropriate protocol to help the recovery? Yeah. So actually, I used to work for a neurologist who utilized a combination of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, oh, which mine. is a way to really flood Excellent. the brain with oxygen, gets the brain back working online after a head injury. He would use he used the combination of that as well as neurofeedback as a dual approach to really treating uh, head injuries or traumatic brain injuries. So it is something that is you know used extensively for that purpose. I don't exclusively work with that population just because mm -hmm. I'm not a, a neurologist myself. So there's definitely plenty of clients, actually a really significant number of clients I work with who've had past head injuries maybe they don't even realize or have forgotten, oh yeah, you know, when, when I was 12, I fell off my bike and, you know, like lost consciousness that, that I can't tell you how often I'll have to ask someone two, three times, you know, have you had any head injuries ever, any blows to the head, you ever lose consciousness Interesting. and it'll be like, no, no. And then, and then they start remembering, oh my I God. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, that's a very common reason behind why someone's brain, you know, why someone's having struggles with their mental health or brain performance. You know, I, I really like to think of mental health struggles as brain health struggles, because oftentimes what's behind our anxiety or depression, you know, is really something going on on a biological level with your brain. So the clients that come to your practice, uh, mostly are they healthy people or is people that really are looking for something specific? What is that? Yeah, there's there's kind of a mix. I would say there's the, the peak performance crowd, you know, people who are really doing pretty well in life, you know, they're mm -hmm. high achieving people, uh, but they're maybe burning the candle on both ends. They're trying to juggle running a business or multiple business with raising a family and, and all the other obligations in life. Um, and maybe they're feeling burnt out or low energy. They don't have the productivity that they once had. There's that crowd. And then I would say there's people, you know, I would call them the the seekers, you know, people who are wanting to explore their consciousness, people who are into things like meditation, breath work, psychedelics, you know, so I work with a lot of people who are just wanting to explore the realms of consciousness and see really mm -hmm. what's possible in terms of, uh, you know, how their brain is performing. And then there are people, you know, who are struggling with different mental health issues, who people who've been on antidepressants or on stimulant medications for several years, or they maybe have recently been diagnosed with one of those conditions and they don't want to take medication. So it's people right. that, you know, have mental health issues who are looking for an alternative. I hate, I hate to even say the word alternative because it makes, I, I feel like the connotation I have in my mind, whenever someone says alternative is like, oh, it's kind of like quackery or that might not, but like UIG. in my yeah, exactly. When in reality, as I was saying, neurofeedback's been around. It has 12, over 1,200 mm -hmm. empirical studies behind it, and it's been around for decades. So, um, so in reality, you know, there, there's nothing, there's nothing new agey about it. But, um, but yeah. 
Okay, let's talk about a little bit about mental health. Um, we know today, and this data is alarming after COVID-19, that the uh, percentage of the population committing suicide after COVID rampage like 40% versus previous years. And that, uh, you know, all of the lockdowns and, and the worries and the stress and, um, you know, all of the restrictions on being with loved ones and feeling a part of a community was, you know, one of the many, many factors contributing to, to the, you know, to the percentages on, on people committing suicide during those years. The stats are not going down which means people are more and more depressed as we, thought, as we are speaking here. So how technology like this can help if, if it's, I mean, on that specific population? How do you see that, that neurofeedback, this neuromodulation and stimulation of the brain can come to the help of those? You know, when the brain is challenged, so whether that challenge is from social isolation, as you mentioned, you know, from the pandemic, whether that's challenge as far as a poor diet, where there's a lot of neural inflammation, whether that's a challenge of you know, adverse trauma. I was like going to go there. The adverse, like our veterans. Yep. Or, or people who grew up with a lot of adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you know, traumas that occurred when we were a kid, they've found that people who've had a, a high number of those traumas have significantly higher levels of mental health issues as adults. So with all of these things, you know, they're, they're way, you know, things that really weigh on the brain. So, you know, what's causing someone to, you know, go so far as to commit suicide when they see no other option for, you know, managing their life or for treating their depression, um, you know, it's really coming down to, you know, the brain is, is really not functioning properly at all on a biological level. We're able to see that as far as with other types of brain scans, they can measure decreased blood flow and oxygenation in people who are severely depressed uh, or mm. just don't have well-functioning brains, as well as that's something we're able to see with dysregulated brain waves. So people, there's something that's driving someone's brain to that point where they're just thinking, oh, I, you know, I don't know about if I want to do this anymore. You know, a healthy, well-functioning brain is going to result in people, you know, being, I say, happy, healthy, and wealthy. When the brain is not functioning properly, that's when issues occur. So I think with brain mapping, it's a way to actually be able to see, you know, for each person, which areas of their brain are problematic. And then also it's up to the clinician really understanding why are those areas problematic? Was it from a past trauma whether it was a, an emotional trauma mm -hmm. or a physical trauma with a head injury or neural inflammation from poor diet or lack of exercise, really figuring out why we're seeing these patterns so that we can then really go about working on them. This is very interesting. And especially um, now that we, we got, um, again, large population like our veterans um, committing suicide and, and in fact, um, I am working with my husband very close to the American Legion. Uh, we're going to be working on the Be The One is the initiative to prevent veterans suicide. So we see that is a large, um, you know, campaign out there to bring consciousness that this is more common than we think. And for many of our veterans, they're thinking about suicide as an option. So how we can come to the help uh, from the nutrition standpoint, as a community, as with technologies that help to train the brain, because what I'm understanding here is we're trying to uh, stimulate the brain to bring that muscle from the current bad habits to the much better ones for a better outcome. So when we are thinking that these technologies may help those populations, we have to think about make them more accessible, and maybe finding more tobies out there that help those in different uh, cities, in different places where, where these uh, technologies can be used. And that is my next question. This uh, brain mapping and uh, 
basically the protocols for, uh, you know, stimulating the brain and bringing to, to the optimization. They have to be in person or they can be uh, virtual. Yeah. So I previously was working with, mo you know, most of my clients in person um, in Fort Lauderdale or Miami, but I realized that it's actually quite difficult, you know, to when, when we're go going back to talk about how many sessions it really is ideal for someone to do neurofeedback, right? So in the research, it says 20, 30, 40, sometimes mm -hmm. even up to 60 sessions, depending on what someone's dealing with. So I was realizing that there, it's just difficult to actually get the compliance, you know, in terms of I work with a lot of busy professionals who just don't you know, find it very difficult to find time in their schedule to mm -hmm. carve out that many appointments. So instead, I realized that I would try out a virtual option, which has actually been really great so far, where I'm able to just directly send people the equipment. So they're actually able through the use of an app, as well as, you know, guidance where I'm working together with someone on a remote level, but they're able to actually record a mini brain scan themselves and then able to actually go through the neurofeedback training their brain whenever they want and wherever they are. Um, so I really like the virtual option. It's not like quite as comprehensive of a, you know, a process as it would be in person, but nonetheless, for a lot of people who maybe they're in cities where they don't have access to someone who does neurofeedback, I've actually been speaking to some people in different countries like Barbados or Dubai, places that, you know, are people, practitioners have reached out to me and they're interested in getting neurofeedback in these places. And there's just not anyone who's doing it right now. So I think in, in those circumstances, the virtual, you know, is really a great choice. But there's also, you know, people who love that just in person element, you mm -hmm. are able to use, you know, the best highest quality devices and some different things. But um, for, for a lot of people, the virtual options, actually, they're able to get a lot of similar benefits as they would in person, but it's just a lot more convenient. So for someone that may be interested in getting the certifications uh, yep. to be able to, to do this job, where they go? Yeah, so there's two resources. People can go to bcia.org. Um, that's the Board Certification International Alliance. They're the mm -hmm. ones who handle the certification for neurofeedback. Um, to do that, you need to go through a didactic course, basically an online course where you learn about neurofeedback, you learn the history, you learn different protocols and practices, and then you also get a mentor. You need to get a certain mm -hmm. number, I forgot how many exactly, but a certain number of mentorship hours, so training under a professional um, who's been doing neurofeedback for a long time. I was lucky enough to, um, I moved to South Florida to work for a, a practitioner who's a, a board certified mentor who's been doing this for three decades. And he became my mentor for both the brain, for both the neurofeedback as well as the brain mapping certifications. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a process, either, either one of those that takes some time I'd say maybe mm -hmm. like six to nine months for each of the certifications. But, um, but yeah, for people, I mean, we definitely need more neurofeedback practitioners. So for people who are interested, you know, going to BCIA.org, you can learn about the neurofeedback certification. And then the other one, I believe if you go to, if you just Google the International QEEG Alliance, they're mm -hmm. the ones who handle the certification for brain mapping. So yeah, Perfect. so basically you, you go through this course, you get your mentorship hours, and then you take a test at the end, and then you are now board certified. So it's not like a weekend seminar, you know, it's months and months of you know, actually learning, you know, uh, reading, as well as actually getting the hands-on training. So Toby, talking again about our veterans and the increased number of um, cases of veteran suicide, I would like to ask you, um, this neurofeedback, the, the brain mapping, the stimulation of the brain can help someone with PTSD that have, a, you know, traumatic injuries that have these bad patterns of, of uh, trauma in their brains. 
how uh, addictions, because a lot of them in, in top of the PTSD, they became addicted to alcohol or, or, or you know, substances. So how uh, this technology can come to a help? Right. So, you know, when the brain has experienced some sort of trauma, so in this case, you know, with emotional or psychological trauma, it can greatly rewire someone's brain in a negative way where people experience a traumatic event and then they have this enduring fear response and they get easily startled and they can't sleep. And that's a condition known as PTSD. So post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, is something that really plagues a lot of veterans, but there's a lot of things that can be done about it with neurotechnology. So such as the neurofeedback. So I was working at a rehab clinic uh, in basically in Deerfield Beach, Florida, where there was a lot of veterans that came in. There was a big, um, big kind of veteran program that we dealt with. And uh, there was a lot of benefits that, you know, a lot of those individuals went through transformations when doing neurofeedback to really heal from past traumas in conjunction, you know, with doing therapy and other, you know, supportive interventions, living a Uh healthy lifestyle. But yeah, there's absolutely, you know, people, regardless of the diagnosis, including PTSD, people are not stuck with, with that diagnosis. There's, you know, ways you can rewire the brain. People just need to have access to the resources uh, to do so. This is all good, and and again, as as more and more we're expanding the the uh, our listeners, um, and we are getting a lot more demand on talking about mental health. You know, because we understand that at the at the you know nutritional level, we need to do some changes as a population. We understand that now. Chronic diseases are eighty percent of the national expenditure on the healthcare in system in in the U.S. alone. Eighty percent of the of the healthcare expenditure go to chronic diseases, mainly metabolic diseases. So, food is a big thing. Diet is a big thing to fix for the whole population. But we also need to address the mental health. Mm-hmm. Something major that we're gonna be talking more and more here in my podcast. So I appreciate your your um, your expertise and telling us more about how these technologies or neurostimulation can help um, those that are suffering with the post-traumatic syndrome, PTSD, and other traumatic um, injuries in the brain, as well as addictions and, and, you know, that kind of conditions that affect someone's life. And in many cases are just the right conditions for people suicide. So this is, uh, we're talking about preventative measurements here, and I'm glad that you you work in those rehab uh, programs with uh, success stories that you're sharing with us today. So thank you very much. I would like to um, talk to you about something, uh, and it has been haunting me here. Um, <laughs> as Because I know my audience is going to be asking about this. Um, if they want to start a protocol of brain optimization, how much is that cost? Yeah. So there's basically the, the core option where I work with people for two months. So they're basically doing the brain scan, the initial brain mm-hmm. scan, and then two months of unlimited neurofeedback training, as well as they're getting access to a guided breath work journey and these mm-hmm. binaural beat meditation tracks that really calm and quiet the nervous system. Excellent. I'm also working um, with people, you know, on a one-on-one basis. So every couple of weeks meeting with people, helping them implement, you know, different nutritional strategies to optimize their brain, working on sleep, other biohacks, really, you know, laying the foundation for good brain health as someone's moving through the neurofeedback training. Because that's, that's really... What I'm about is just stacking together as many positive interventions as possible, right? So neurofeedback, you know, just in isolation, people, you know, are still going to maybe receive some benefits, but Mm -hmm. it is so much more powerful when you stack it with breath work, with meditation, with a a brain healthy diet, Mm -hmm. supplementation. So yeah, for that whole package where I work with people one-on-one for two months, I charge Mm 4,000. It's good to know. And for the audience out there, we're going to post all the information uh, of Toby down in the description uh, box below. So you have access to the links to his uh, website, to his contact. 
And if you want to go into a protocol of brain optimization, the information is going to be there. Now, question, uh, Toby, for brain optimization in your experience, what would be the best supplements that anyone listening at this podcast can be taking for, for uh, optimizing the brain, the functions of the brain? Yeah, I would say a couple of really basic ones that nearly everyone should be taking would be vitamin D. So a lot of people don't get enough sunlight exposure. You know, mm -hmm. even people that like I live in Florida and I worked at a rehab clinic where, you know, they would measure everyone's vitamin D levels along with some other blood labs when someone would first come in. And I was amazed to see how many people were still vitamin D deficient, even living in a place like Florida where we have year round access to the sun. Because it's just we live very, you know, indoor lives. We work in offices. We get limited exposure to to sunlight. And it's even worse for people in, you know, climates where there's, there's yes, not much sun throughout the winter months where it's cold. Yeah. So vitamin D supplementation is a great idea. I think it's advisable to do it based on your blood test. So if you do a vitamin D blood test, you're able to get a baseline again, just like brain mapping, right? It's a baseline shows you where you're Individual. at and then it kind of, you know, you can work with a functional medicine doctor to kind of particular, you know, find your ideal dosage based on your test result. Now, at the same time, you know, for people who aren't going to do that, taking, you know, a vitamin D supplement just on a daily basis, I think is still a great, great idea. And then the other big one I would say would be magnesium. So magnesium is a calming mineral that is involved in over 300 different enzymatic processes. So different biological processes, including a lot of neurological brain related stuff. And there's estimates that 65 to 70% of the US population is actually deficient in magnesium, primarily due to the new, uh, soil Diet. being nutrient depleted, you know, so eating, you know, potatoes or other, you know, foods, you know, from from soil, you know, decades ago, when there was a lot less uh, antibiotic uses or, or pesticides, all this stuff, that's negatively impacting the soil, the food was much more nutrient rich. Nowadays, you know, everyone has plenty of food with fast food, but the actual content, the nutritional content of that food is very low for a lot of people. So um, magnesium is a great supplement, you know, that a lot of people really do need that helps. What kind of, of magnesium is the best for the brain? That's great question. Great question. Because there's magnesiums like oxide, that are not really well absorbed, they're gonna, you know, if someone has constipation, digestive issues, that's great. But magnesium, uh, types of magnesium that are really good for the brain, I would say a lot of the ones that end in eight, like citrate, malate, glycinate. Glycinate's a really mm -hmm. great one because um, it's bound to an amino acid called glycine, which also mm -hmm. improves our sleep. So I like taking magnesium glycinate at night and then there's also another one called three and eight magnesium three and eight that's been particularly studied um, that really crosses readily crosses the blood brain barrier and can improve oh, wow. memory as well as actually protect uh, brain cells and, and stabilize cell membranes. So there's there's multiple different magnesiums that are good. Um, I like, you know, taking them all in conjunction. Um, there's a product I really like that has like seven different highly absorbed forms of magnesium. So I, I, I think it's best to kind of stack together a bunch of different forms rather than maybe just take one. Um, and I've seen really for my own um, blood tests measuring my magnesium levels that, you know, taking that combination of different types seems to really be a lot more beneficial than just isolating it to one form. Excellent. So in your opinion, what is the best food for the brain? Oh, the best food for the brain. Or a group of I mean, foods that are better for their brain. I would say groups of foods would be easy. I would say fats, <laughs> healthy fats. Um, particularly, yeah, you know, I think extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil. These are super foods for the brain that are being studied, you know, that they could potentially actually, you know, lower someone's risk of developing Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative conditions. There's actually some stories about people utilizing uh, coconut oil or, or specifically MCT oil, which is like mm -hmm. a high potency form of coconut oil and actually treating things like Alzheimer's or different 
um, forms of, of neurodegeneration. So I think those would, would definitely be some of my favorites as well as like dark chocolate, you know, butter, eggs. So a lot it. of things that taste really good um, are also really good for the brain. But really staying away from the things that people should not be eating, like sugar, you know, for people sugar who are sensitive. Sugar would be the worst. <laughs> Sugar is the worst. Yes, even though I, 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 I'm guilty of having a sweet tooth, but it's it's definitely something I try to minimize as much as possible. Toby, if if sugar would be labeled as poison, people were not eating that much. But it it is. People are addicted, I mean, though. I I think they might they might have a hard time stopping, even if it was labeled poison. <laughs> But yeah, that you're is right. possibly true. <laughs> that is true. Now let's talk about a little bit about something that I I um I was uh, earlier you mentioned it and it is part of a, a you know a protocol that can be working really good hand in hand with the, the neurofeedback, with the brain stimulation, with the diets, and is the use of um, nootropics basically. And and especially mushrooms. Um, what is your opinion on those? You know, I would I would definitely make a clear distinction there as far as you know nootropics, different cognitive enhancers that are mm-hmm. you know, to, to classify as a nootropic. I think someone something needs to both enhance someone's brain performance as well as be neuroprotective in the long run. For instance, mm-hmm. something like Adderall. Some people would classify it as a nootropic because it speeds no. you up, it gives you motivation, and energy, but it's not, it doesn't meet the formal definition of a nootropic because you crash and it really is just not good for long-term brain health, even though it temporarily improves brain performance. So different nootropics that can actually, you know, you know, boost brain performance, boost different aspects of memory, focus, mm-hmm. reduce stress. Um, all of these different things that actually are also neuroprotective and help, you know, ensure long, uh, good long-term brain health are amazing. And some of those nootropics could include like the functional mushrooms. So specifically lion's mane is a, a type of, of one of a mushroom. Yeah. That has great brain health benefits. It boosts levels of a compound called BDNF. So brain derived neurotrophic factor. That actually helps your brain grow new neurons, new connections amongst those brain cells. So I, I think lion's mane is an excellent nootropic. And then in terms of mushrooms, what I assume you're you're referring to is you know psilocybin or magic psilocybin. mushrooms. Yeah. So I think microdosing can be a really powerful nootropic um, for some people looking to elevate their mood, um, to boost energy for some. You know, I think I would definitely distinguish you know like full doses mm-hmm. of psychedelics even though they they have you know a lot of benefits when used therapeutically in a clinical environment um but i wouldn't necessarily classify those as nootropics the kind of a completely different class of compounds yes altogether but you could argue that um you know things like microdosing psilocybin also microdosing lsd is actually a popular nootropic option that a lot of people in silicon valley there were, there were articles several years ago, there were a bunch of major news outlets that picked up these articles of uh, people in Silicon Valley actually starting to replace taking Adderall with taking very small microdoses of LSD. Interesting. You're talking about the people working on your newest technologist. So somehow they, and, and you know, most of, most of that population, they really deep into their research. They won't do anything that you know, on themselves, that is not going to be bringing the results that they want. Um, that's very, very interesting. Actually, I was reading this morning a post from Dr. Andrew Huberman. You probably know about him in, in um, neuroscientist. And it is a new research now uh, basically describing that the correct stimulation of an area on the brain, I mean, they discovered that it's an area on the brain that can really bring um, the willpower, enhance the willpower, something that until now was believed to be only intentionally that you you just intentionally exercise with your meditations and your affirmations and trying to do consistently certain disciplines, you will exercise your willpower. Now we're learning that 
stimulating the brain in the correct area and the correct way will enhance the willpower. I, I thought that was fascinating, fascinating because again, we're learning so much about the brain and the use of technology now um, to stimulate it in, in basically becoming a little bit like a superhumans. Absolutely. I mean, what is the future of these technologies? Uh, Toby, where do you see all of these technologies going in the near future? Yeah, I mean, I would say definitely, I think, you know, what my aim is, you know, is to bring these technologies more to mainstream awareness. You know, they're, as I was saying, nothing new, nothing brand new. These are technologies that are well-researched, well-studied, uh, that are shown to be safe and effective. It's just that not a lot of people know about them. So I think we're going to start seeing within the next five years, 10 years, uh, a lot more people are going to start learning about these things. The actual equipment and software itself is going to get more and more refined. Uh, I think AI is going to, as it has revolutionized a lot of other mm -hmm. industries, you know, it's also going to revolutionize the neurofeedback and brain mapping space. So there's a lot of different, you know, definitely very exciting developments. Um, but I think in reality, I think, you know, training our brain is going to be something in the future that's a lot more normalized, you know, something just like going to the gym to work out our body. It's going to be, you know, treated, treated similar to that rather than, you know, how it, I think, I think with, you know, the pandemic and people talking more about mental health, I think there's less stigma, but I think there is still a lot of stigma, um, or, you know, in certain circles about, you know, doing something to work on our, our mental health when it comes to, you know, working on our brain. I think it is something that makes a lot more sense to people that it's a biological issue rather than they're somehow I agree. crazy. I agree. And, and again, all of this uh, new science, all of this uh, biohacking, we are doing more experimentations because we're finding out that the traditional medicine is not solving the problems that we want, is not an individualized treatment is more like, uh, you know, one solution fits all. So I think this is fascinating. And, and I, we learned a lot today from you, uh, on this, uh, all of this, uh, uh neurofeedback and, 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 uh, stimulation of the brain. And, and I think this is incredibly, um, an explored area with tremendous potential. My last question to you, Toby, where is uh, all of these technologies, brain mapping, um, you know, brain stimulation fits into the longevity? Is this helping longevity or not? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely, you know, improving our healthy brain performance as someone ages. I think neurofeedback definitely is a great strategy just to, you know, reduce reduce the risk of neurodegeneration, right? Because mm -hmm. it's very difficult once someone already does have Alzheimer's or another neurodegenerative condition, very hard to reverse that. So it's a lot better to take preventative strategies, you know, Absolutely. all going back to things we've talked about, having good, healthy diet, exercising. And I think- Daily you know, saunas. Daily use of sauna has been a study exactly. to prevent- neurodegenerative diseases and cardiovascular diseases and all kinds of diseases is something that our ancestors did. Our uh, Native Americans used to get into the Temascals every day. Is this something that we, we should be doing more in the, in the modern lives? Absolutely. Well said. Perfect. So this is all great people uh, to know more and learn more about uh, brain mapping and how to enhance the brain at peak performance and, and this fascinating science, even for uh, brain recovery, they can go and see the information that we're going to post in, in the description box below. And Toby, this has been a very, very nice enlightening conversation with you. I invite you to come in another time to our podcast to talk about in a specific subject. And I am sure our, our listeners are going to post a lot of questions. They probably going to have um, follow-up questions and, and we're going to let you know about those because, again, we are tapping into the new frontier of the science, all of this biohacking 
taking the humans to to optimal levels to live longer, happier, and healthier lives. That's what we're doing here, letting you know, guys, what are the latest technologies that you are you disposed to enhance your performance to live longer and live happier. So thank you well, very step. much, Toby, for the stepping day here, talking to us about your expertise, and we wish you the best. And again, you're invited to come back here. And remember, my friends, until next time, health is wealth for the body, mind, and soul. Take care. If you like the content of our podcast, please subscribe and hit the notification button. And also remember to visit our description box to support our sponsors, Expresso Coffee. Expresso Coffee is our brand of coffee designed with your health in mind. All our coffees are clean of molds and pesticides. Sana is 100% organic. And the best is that we have them in all presentations, whole being grounded and K-Cups. So go to www.expressolcoffee.com and order your coffees with the code PODCAST15 for 15% off of your order. Thank you very much. And remember, until next time, health is wealth for the body, mind, and soul. Take care. Thank you very much for listening. And if you like the information that we shared with you today, please subscribe to the Express Soul Health and Wellness podcast and follow us in the social media outlets of your choice. Until next time, please remember, health is wealth for the body, mind and soul.